There we go. Hey everyone, welcome to the Suffolk Legal Innovation and Technology Labs first Wednesday workshops on the second Wednesday of the month for the second workshop. That's okay, we'll sort it out. Um, we had a holiday. Uh, for the Document Assembly Line community, along with our weekly community meetings, these workshops are part of how we support the Document Assembly Line, the community of courts and legal aid organizations building guided interviews with DocAssemble and the Document Assembly Line tools. Today's topic is troubleshooting DocAssemble interview errors, and our expert guest is Michelle, who's been working with the Document Assembly Line community since early days. I'll ask you to introduce yourself in one minute. Um, for that, this workshop is being recorded, and we will share it on our YouTube channel. To find that, just search for Suffolk Lit Lab on YouTube. We've gathered questions from the community in the Document Assembly Line's Microsoft Teams forum, and you can also use the Q&A feature in Zoom to ask questions during the workshop. Chat is enabled, but please use the Q&A feature for questions so they don't get lost in the chat. I will keep an eye on those and let Michelle know if she doesn't see them, although she's often better at keeping an eye on chat and Q&A than I am, so we'll see. Um, guest video is disabled, but since it often helps to share your screen to demonstrate a problem, you can do that. Just please wait till we invite you to. Before we dive in, if you're hearing about the Lit Lab or the document assembly line for the first time, head over to SuffolkLitLab.org to see our shiny new website and learn more. Everyone who uses DocAssemble and the document assembly line tools is welcome to attend our weekly community meetings, join our community forum on Microsoft Teams, and attend these workshops. If you'd like to join us, just email us at litlab at suffolk.edu and we'll help get you access. And now let's get started. Michelle, I know it feels awkward to introduce yourself to a bunch of people who already know you, but imagine all the new document assembly line users who might see this on YouTube. So go ahead and introduce yourself. And I think you can take it from here, but I'll be along for the ride. Okay, everybody, people of the world. I'm Michelle. I am a volunteer on the assembly line uh, Suffolk Lit Lab. Uh, project document assembly line. That's the official name. I've been here uh, since the beginning of the pandemic um, when the project was first taking off. I am a coder completely. I have no law experience. Don't ask me any questions about law. I have no answers. Um, but um, my experience is in front end development, JavaScript, Python, and now Markdown, Mako, YAML, Jinja, all the good doc assemble stuff, uh, CSS, uh, and those kinds of tricks. And um, yeah, I, I've been building the Ale Kiln framework, which is a testing framework for running end to end tests on your doc assemble interviews. Um, okay, I think if that's sufficient, then I'll move on that to. That is sufficient. That's great. All right, I'll move on to. This is more of a question and answer workshop. So I have things to say if people don't have questions, but what we're planning to do is talk about errors in DocAssemble and debugging. I'm mostly familiar with inter errors that arise in interviews. Um, so errors that arise from servers or uh, third party databases like AWS and S3. Less familiar, but maybe some people on the call will also have information. So it's worth asking uh, if any people are pressed for time. I suggest they go first, and um, we get started. Yeah, maybe I can tee it up um, while we're waiting for the first question. You somebody posted a question the other day, and your response was like, "I don't know specifically how to do this, but here's how I would approach it as in a general sense." And that's actually why I was really excited to have you on this to talk about mm -hmm. troubleshooting interview errors because you have sort of a general purpose approach to troubleshooting. And I'd love to know kind of like when you see an error of any kind, like what do you do? What do you look at? How do you, how do you like step through what could be going wrong and get to the bottom of it? So let's, let's do doc assemble interviews specifically, which, which follow a similar format to other debugging uh, processes that, that I do, but have some specifics that are relevant. Um, so the first thing I do is if there's an error, I, I know this sounds trivial, but look, read the error, <laughs> read the whole entire actual error, um, because there are so many clues that can be in there. And uh, it's one of the things I sometimes forget to do too. But when I look back at the error, things become clear that could not have otherwise been made clear. 
Um, so the first thing to do is read the error if there is one. Um, the next thing I might do if there's an error on the screen is, uh, and it's possible, I will open up the source button, which is the button that is in the heading of a development server that looks like this with a little slash in it. Um, so that is the, uh, that will open up what I call the stack trace, which is the order of the way the code was run. And it will show you what variables docassemble was looking for in what order as it was getting to the place where it is. Um, the uh, assembly line has a special error screen, a custom error screen that it shows. And this information is the technical information. So if you hit the drop down, that will show and it's showing the exact same information. Um, if that, generally speaking, the useful information is at the bottom. Sometimes there's some extraneous stuff going on in the bottom and you scroll up a bit to see, to find the, the, the problem. Um, and if you're using assembly line, you can ignore things about name labels and address labels and things like that. Um, so after you're done looking at the stack trace, um, or, you know, if that's not possible, sometimes it's a syntax error, for example. Oh my gosh, there's so many branching paths here. But the next step for me is often uh, looking at the code. If it's an undefined variable, I try and find, um, usually the stack trace has told me approximately where to look for where the problem is happening. Um, I, if it's a syntax problem, I have uh, some, ooh, if I can find them, some links to syntax validators that can help track uh, just like pinpoint problems in code, um, in some code. It doesn't know docassembles, you know, uh, specific uh, uses of language. So because docassemble uses language in some interesting ways. Um, and then if I'm still having trouble, it depends on what I've found. One of the next things I often do is make the smallest reproducible example possible. So I try and pinpoint where has the problem happened? What is the simplest code I can have that will, repro that will reproduce the behavior that I want and try it out in a separate new um, form? Um, that an interview, a, a YAML file that is just for that information. Um, sometimes the code that I need to run is too complicated for that. But if you can do that, that can be incredibly clarifying. Um, another thing I do, so what that means is not just oh, copy the block, but it means, for example, if I have a, um, a screen that is erroring, I will comment out everything except for the question. Just run it and see if the question shows up by itself. Once the question shows up, I add the sub question with the first line. Then I add the next line. Then I add the fields with one of the fields and so on and so forth. Um, this can be, even if there's not an error, for example, a screen won't move on to the next page. This can be a helpful uh, troubleshooting technique as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are things like reading the code itself that can be uh, useful. I find that a bit brute force, a bit hard to get through. And I, I tend not to locate things that way, but some people find that that helps. Um, I print values, meaning I use the command log, L-O-G, parentheses, your variable, close parentheses. I run it and then you look in the doc assemble logs. I actually run it with an extra little argument, comma, quote, console, close quote. And then it actually prints in the inspector, which I might show later with the, the, the browser developer tools, which I'm just more comfortable uh, using. And um, you can, I also, if there's a problem going on with if statements and if logic, I sometimes, or, or, some order of the code, or I just can't tell where in the code something's happening, I'll put a log, even every other line. I'll say, you know, log one, log two, log three, 
doesn't matter what's in there as long as they're distinct from each other. And I can tell where the problem starts happening and what the execution order actually is. Execution order meaning which lines are getting run and when they're getting run and in what order. Um, Michelle, Chris, yeah, Chris is I asking think, uh, yeah. about oh, um, I covered using that line numbers in errors, um, which I think is kind of relevant to what you're just saying. Often the error will say the problem started at this line number and she's wondering how to make that meaningful. Yes, yes. <laughs> so that's a really good question. Uh, just so you know, I can't see the Q&A. I can ask a question. Okay, good. Well, then I will tee it up for you. All right, great. Um, or maybe it just needed refreshing. I, I have no idea. But so the line number is actually only giving you the line number within a block. So from the start of the block, that's one. Um, and it goes down from there. So um, so sometimes what I do in a long block, especially, is I copy the block and I paste it to a fresh interview or editor screen if one is is um, um, is using VS Code or Sublime Text, which is my favorite. And um, uh, then, then it's a little easier for me to find the line. And remember that wrapped lines are still just one line. You want to look at the you want to look at the number that you don't want to count down. You want to look at the number that's on the left column. And isn't it the the, um, the line number that the error? So Caroline is and Chris are both are is chiming in. How do you know which block the line is in? Um, I mean, the playground has line numbers in it, right? The 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 code editor does have line numbers yeah. in it, but you if a if a block starts on line one hundred and the error says line five, it's not line five in the whole script. It's just line five in that block. Yeah. Um, and so and it's my understanding is that it it means the the line where the error finally happened, which doesn't necessarily mean the line the that was the, the problem. problem. Yes. Right. Like if you've in JavaScript, for example, if you've forgotten to close a bracket, it actually may the error may happen down here because of the way the functions got bounced around. And so it actually, you know, it's it's you can't always find it based on the line number, but it just means where it came crashing to a halt. I think that's right, isn't it? Yes, it's where the error happened, which uh unfortunately uh calculating whether you intended to close a bracket on line 10 or line 100 is not a computable problem for computers. They can't, they can't, it's just, it's not solvable. It is a problem I, I tried to solve when I was first programming and that took me down some rabbit holes that, you know, um, like, yeah, oh, that's a different reference that no one will get. But um, <laughs> the, the code just, the error happens where the code is no longer able to execute uh, a bracket can do that. Sometimes a, mis a mistake with a quote can do that or some other kind of syntax that tends to be a syntax error. You know which block the line is in because the code of the block, if you're getting line numbers, then the code of the block should also be present. If you have a different kind of, if you don't have that error at the top of the screen, if you have this long line, line, line just a bunch of text, uh, that means, uh, which usually appears at the end of the stack trace, the source button uh, error display. Um, it means something probably happened incorrectly in a uh, maybe a Python file, or I, you know, some sometimes index out of range errors, and can get to that happen that way. Um, and the stack those trace line will tell numbers, you what file it is in, right? If you're getting a line number, then it should be also showing you the block that you're getting it from. If you see a bunch of line numbers and a bunch of files that you don't recognize, those aren't relevant to you. Um, and those those errors are a bit harder to read in DocAssemble to know where they're coming from. I see a question from Emily. Um, if you have time to go back to the mention logging, a uh, bit of background would be helpful, interesting, but it was a bit over my head. Okay, so let me actually open up logging. I'm gonna share my screen. 
Um, oh, I wish they could do that a, diff a bit differently, but, um, and I'm going to uh, show some logging stuff. So, mandatory true code log. Um, so let's do a regular log first. Wonder if this will run by itself, probably, but just in case. And so if I save this and run it, can't see half my screen because Zoom doesn't, you won't be able to see anything on here, but if I go to logs, I will be able to see hello coder right here. So this is where log happens if you log this way. And if I log a little bit differently with one additional argument, um, and I will do this visibly. So if I right click and I select inspect, it will open up the console in here. Uh, well, the elements pane, and I click on the console pane, and I will see it logged as text in my browser development tools, but that's a bit, uh, that's just more comfortable for me because I am more comfortable with the browser tools. So um, that's not necessary for anyone. Um, is and that, does that help this, clarify like... what's happening? Um, sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, and so how do you use that in... I mean, I know how, like, when I'm doing JavaScript, I'm wondering, like, has this has this loop even started? Has, has this file even loaded? And I'll, I'll use console logs all the time to do that. And then I'll wonder, like, is the value what I expect it to be? And so I'll log the value, and I'll follow that along. And so maybe an example of how you might use it in, in troubleshooting to figure out, you know, maybe are, are your values not getting, your variables not getting set or something like that? How might you use it to work your way through an interview? So let's do an example of um, Let's do data type. No, yep. maybe that'll work. We'll see. Um, and let's set something to um, right, object equals to bar. Um, and then I say my object, uh, dot foo, uh, let's, let's try it differently. Um, oh, we're good. Let's see if this will work for us to show us a problem. So, oh, right. I have to add a continue button field. Otherwise, we're not going anywhere. We can open up the console. We can say we, we can see we got hello coder twice. And if people are curious about that, they can talk about that. Um, and we got true because we answered the continue, we clicked the continue button field, which set this to true. 
And now we're getting an error and it says attribute error dict object has no attribute foo, which is nice and opaque um, and is actually a Python error because I made what is called a dictionary, but I am trying to access it uh, with a dot and then an attribute name, not a key name. So what I can do here is I can um, log in uh, my, my object, actually maybe repr, but it, it usually it doesn't get this complicated. I, I chose something that was uh, complicated. And this isn't actually going to show me much now that I think about it. But open up, and I'm just using a, a shortcut. I'm logging in. It says foobar, and that is what I expect. But I happen to know Python. Um, so I can, for example, I can try different things. I can try my object dot foo, and I'll find I get the same error, except for I won't even, yep. I'll get a slightly different error because it was in the code. When your errors change, that is a fantastic thing. Always be happy when your errors change. I know it may sound um, a little counterintuitive. So uh, I know that it's in this block. I still know that it's in this block. I know that I'm still having the same problem because the attribute error uh, the object has no attribute foo. And unfortunately, it doesn't tell you which dictionary doesn't have the attribute foo, but I happen to only be looking for one foo. And I happen to know that what the problem is, is um, that I'm accessing the value in a different way. If you want, I can, I can do a different error that is actually more clarifying about the nature of why hello coder is appearing multiple times. But, um, and there we go, bar appears. Uh, but if you do know how to read the error, uh, and if you don't know how to read the error, it's a little confusing because this is Python, but you can look up at the doc, you can search online for Access, accessing dictionary keys like an attribute. Stack Overflow is often a good uh, place for that. And just search for the error, the whole error. See what comes up. Um, so, um, and answers in here might say things that you don't understand and then you'll go down a rabbit hole and then you'll come ask us. But you can try a few of these different ones and see if any of them um, give you anything useful. And you can try things like uh, Python attribute uh, and things like that. Um, I don't know. I hope that was helpful in some way, shape, or form. I think so. I mean, There's I... A question. I... Mm -hmm. I have con I use console logs all over my code to like because I want to know did is does the you know when you get an error and, it, and you're not sure where it is you want to find out okay what's the variable what is the variable set to and sometimes knowing what it thinks the variable is will help you diagnose the error it's it's a good way to yeah. track things down yeah um, um mm -hmm. we uh, this is this is maybe a, this is a little. Sort of what, while while our summer cohort of students were working on their things, initially they had a bunch of errors where the interview was asking a question, and the error wasn't showing up on the on ultimately on the PDF form. Um, and I'm wondering the the value where you mean? Do you go. Yeah, I'm sorry. the 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 value that somebody entered was supposed to be showing up on the form, and and it isn't. Um, how do you start tracking that down? So one is. Um... Oh gosh. So all this type, these types of things are such tricky problems because you almost have to know what the problem is in order to be able to find out what the problem is. Um, and since Docker symbol is a very niche 
you know, uh, platform, it has a little less information about it on there, though LLMs do know about it. So ChatGPT might be a good way of debugging as well. Um, so that problem happens both on uh, attachment blocks, uh, templates that have skip undefined set to true and on review screens. When something is not appearing, it's because it is either one, not defined, or two, it is causing some kind of error. And because you've told DocAssemble to skip undefined, it says, all right, I'll ignore what's going wrong and I'll just, you know, leave it blank um, without telling you anything about it, which is fun. Um, and in that case, I often log it or I, another way you can do logging is printing things on the screen uh, as I showed before where I was, where I put my object foo onto the, into the sub question. If you, if you're not sure what the value of a, of a thing is, you can do that and you can see, uh, it'll show you on, on your question, uh, what the value is. If the value itself is causing an error, you have to do a little bit more troubleshooting in other ways. But if it's just an unexpected value, one that you, um, you know, weren't able to identify, um, that might be a really good way of moving forward. That's another way of logging without using log, which I can show. And Emily, if you still have a question about logging, uh, feel free to uh, enumerate, um, elaborate. Both. <laughs> Uh, you alluded, alluded earlier to syntax validators, and I'm wondering if, because one of the questions I have is like, is there a better way to track down syntax errors than just staring at the screen looking for a straight tick that should be a back tick or, a, you know, like, or a, is there a better way than just staring at the screen until something pops out at me? Before oh, I go yes. Back? Oh, yes. In most cases, in most cases. So let me pull up some links and the people the people of the world will not be able to see these but these are some and i'll i'll bring them up on my screen as well um let me see hmm. computers gotta love them <sighs> I tried to be fancy. That's what you get. Uh, that is a Jinja syntax validator and a Markdown syntax validator. And one more, which is a YAML syntax validator. These will find some things. Some things uh, you will have to work a little bit harder to find. Now, the what I haven't found yet is a Mako validator. Um, but let me share my screen again and demo, if folks are interested, what this kind of um, validator can do. Uh, let's see. I'll go with YAML. I mean, I'm interested. I'm frantically bookmarking all of these. <laughs> these are good. And they can, and syntax highlighting can be your friend, but um, the syntax highlighting in doc assemble is not always consistent. So, oh, come on, friends. They conspire against me. Okay. So for example, I can say uh, mandatory true code. Awesome code. Uh, so this works, this is great. If I delete this, it won't tell me much because this is also valid, um, but if I try and say fields, um, a label, 
var name, and then I say label two, you can already see you've got a little X and it says bad indentation of a mapping entry. And it's a bit obscure because it doesn't know we're working with doc assemble, but you can at least tell where the error is and you can look and compare to the other lines and you can say, oh, right? Like maybe the indentation is bad, right? Maybe I, maybe what I meant to say was um, uh, data type, right? So now it's happy. Um, knows. But if it was really label two, label two, I can look more closely at this line and see that I need to fix it. Now, if you get your code, for example, you can see it's not doing anything here. It won't tell you that you can't have code uh, where you uh, um, also have fields that you can't that you can't leave out a question. Uh, if the code in here is Python, then you want to go to a Python validator to get your Python syntax, right? So you would copy all this code. And not just that, um, you would have to unindent it uh, because Python cares about white space. And so you would have to make some allowances for the fact that, oh, let me get the other validator. Um, for the fact that Py the, these validators don't know, uh, again, they don't know DocAssemble. Um, oops. They are free, so we do have ads. They're not free for everyone. Um, so, oh, oops. I hope I can copy there. So, um, if I validate this Python, in some errors, in, yes, here, indentation error and unexpected indent. Because white space is important, it won't like that I have white space here. If I check this syntax, it'll say no syntax errors detected. And I like this syntax checker because it doesn't require my variables to be defined and things like that, which is very nice. Other syntax validators can be less, uh, less friendly to uh, the undefined variables that, that DocAssemble likes. Um, I have other questions. Uh, yeah, you also, question when the values don't show up in attachment, in the attachment, can you also, can't you also go to the interview and look at values and variables to see if the variable actually has a value? You can, um, but uh, the only thing you can do in the if you mean the code of the interview in the YAML, um, you can look at what you've done with the variable, but you can't actually see its values right there. What you can do, oh, I think I know what you're talking about. So, you know what, Oop, that's not working. We can also invite Caroline to jump on voice too. Oh yeah, for awesome. sure. Uh, so, Caroline, I can share, I think this is what, to. Yeah, I think this is what, oh, Zoom. This is what Carolyn is talking about. Sorry, Caroline. Yeah. I have a friend who, too many friends that start with C. Uh, so what you can do is you can hit the source button and you can show variables and values. Yeah, that's what and I And it was... will tell you, there's this pretty print. Uh, Firefox will show up much more, much prettier. Um, and intro, if I search on the page for my variable, I can find them here. This won't show you much about dictionaries. Uh, well, I suppose it'll show you a class in a different kind of way, but it's a bit complex. But it shows you that if you, that you actually got a value for the variable, you know, like you're yes. an empty, Sometimes you, you, for one reason or another, that variable doesn't get a value and that's why it doesn't show up in your attachment. So just to make sure that your variable got a value, I use the thing all the time, just to this make sure true. it's not crazy and it's quick, right? So yeah, yeah, quite true. You can't do it when you're actually looking at the PDF, but as long as you're looking at the interview and can hit that. Yeah, you can button. look at 
Right. I mean, if you get an error in the PDF, then hopefully you haven't closed your interview and you can. Um, now, okay. remember, remember that uh, you can't look at the variables that are on the page. This is just the variables that you set in previous pages. Right. So if right. I wanted to look at this value, I mean, I can show you ways, but um, but there's also, you know, not a way to say what is this? What is the, the, the check for this value? Um, and you did point out uh, Jack Adamson developed a syntax highlighter extension for Docker symbol YAML for VS Code, which mm -hmm. is very awesome. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, and I think I can stop share for a moment. Um, and I, oh, I wish I had the link to that. Caroline, if you find the link to that, stick that in the chat. And yes. um, well, you have to be in. If you go to VS Code and you look at extensions and you just type in Doc Assemble, you get it that way. I don't know that there's a link to the. I mean, I that's not how I get it. I don't have a link to the extension. I just open VS Code and get it that way. Yes. Oh. Oh, and, uh, Sam's got it. There we go. Yep, yeah, it is online, but you can get you. it that the way Caroline described too. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, and Caroline mentioned in the chat um, that if you are using uh, AL Kiln uh, to write your tests, those tests are written in a language called Gherkin. And assert that.com has an online Gherkin editor that will syntax check your, your uh, AL Kiln test code as well. Um, it's worth switching. Is it worth switching from the playground to VS Code if you do a lot of doc assemble programming? So that is really a personal decision. <laughs> Caroline is a huge fan of VS Code. You can see multiple panes next to each other. So you can have the same file open in two places and be looking at different places in the code. Um, it, it'll highlight syntax errors for you. I mean, if you're talking about a syntax checker, yeah, VS Code will will do it without all those sites. Um, I personally uh, hate going back and forth. I just I hate the workflow of going back and forth. So you know, uh, your mileage may vary. What, um, what is the workflow? Do you, are you copying and pasting back and forth, or what is the workflow then? If you're, you can save to OneDrive, and then it will sync up with um, your doc assemble interview and vice versa. Uh, and you can also use doc assemble cli. It's true, Michael, mm -hmm. um, to, to send your code up um, into your project. Um, and, Jack, and Jack also has, has it set up so all of his files are already on his server outside of the container. And so he's just editing, he's using VS code and editing on the server. So it's, it's as quick as there is no back and forth. You just he just edits it right there, which is phenomenal, complicated, and risky. But <laughs> I haven't looked into that yet. Yeah, you can do some interesting things if you're directly editing the files on your server. But I haven't looked into that yet, and that does sound interesting. You have to have certain access permissions in order to be able to do that. Um, but that is is viable for people who have those permissions. Um, and you're right, uh, you, for searching and replacing, supposing you want to replace one variable name everywhere, it's much easier to do, not much easier. It, it is much more possible to do on, uh, on VS Code or an editor like it. Um, you can also use regex to search. If people don't know regular expressions, it's a very dense syntax for looking for things like I want to look for the name, you know, hair color, but I wanted, I only want it if there's a a space before hair or a dot before hair, or if it's surrounded by quotes. Oh well, surrounded by quotes, you can do anyway. But um, you can, you know, or it only th there's there's a lot of details you can put in there to specify exactly what you're looking for. Um. Yes, that that is the I do. Uh, so Michael's bringing up that if you do a lot of uh, Python module, a lot with Python modules, it's easier to do that in VS Code than the playground. Uh, 
I don't know. I, I, I suspect he's, don't they have to sync up? Even if you do it through the doc assemble fly, doesn't the server have to reload once when you send it up? Like I, I from what I understood, if a Python yeah, module so, changes. Yeah. Yeah. So even if a Python module changes, right, um, using the doc assemble fly, you can say no restart if you don't want it to restart. But if you're making Python module changes, you have to restart. Um, but the uh, syntax checking and the ability to test um, in the terminal in VS Code um, make it like a really powerful editor there. Um, and true. then you can also add in like plaque formatter and other tools like that to keep your your Python code neat uh, and understandable. Um, so I found and you can do I, automatic um, formatting with right. prettier and things like that, and linters. There are a lot of, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I do absolutely hate working with modules. So I will, up until the last minute, put all my Python um, functions and classes inside the YAML, which is not good for load times. Um, but is less painful than waiting 60 seconds every time I change a line of, of Python. Um, I just dropped in a couple of specific errors that Matt Newstead and Vivian McNaughton have been seeing in some of their interviews lately. And um, I don't know if with, without seeing them in a specific interview, if there's a how you would go about tracking down the problem. OK, so. The first error we see is, um, let me share my screen again and show what we're looking at. Um, zoom. Okay. So these are a couple errors. Let's see, I can just do so undefined. Um, we won't worry about uh, what our editor thinks of these things. Um, so there was reference to variable variable name that could not be looked up in the question file. Uh, I'm not sure if this is, a, I, yeah, this is the same question. The actual variable defined by the user code is I index. So variable name could be I. I remember this was a problem Vivian and Matt were having. I don't, rem they, I believe they found a solution. I don't know if that is true. If not, I'm not sure this is a place we can debug it, but how that, how you can get errors with I is if you say something like, um, you know, this is your interview order. And you're saying intro, and you're saying user zero dot name dot first, and then you say users, actually users, I dot name dot first, trying to gather something or somehow tell the uh, interview that you want to go through a loop of users. In this situation, I is not appropriate. I is a, well, if you want to use I, you need to say for, uh, you know, parties or party in other parties or, uh, let me see, enumerate. It's complex for party index. Party, let's say I, because we are using I. You can do something close to this. I don't remember the Python. Honestly, my main language is JavaScript. But you have to define I if you're going to use I. Unless you are actually doing a block that is going to be triggered by uh, gather or something like that, um, you cannot use I just randomly in any block uh, because docassemble doesn't know what it is. 
I don't believe that was the problem. If Vivian wants to bring up, uh, if, if Vivian is willing to talk or to uh, share in chat what the specific problem was, um, then I would be totally into that. Um, so. so I don't have an example of the specific problem prepared, mm, partly yeah. because um, this has been an issue that we have not encountered it in our own testing or run through runs through the program. Um, the DA error missing variable issue that we've been having has been just from some um, automated feedback from users. And it seems that they are not hitting an error page either. They're still reaching the download screen, um, but we are receiving notice of this error. But I suspect that there is somewhere in the code where it is um, referring to um, a variable associated with an item in a list both by I and by the specific index. So I'm going to take a look for that because I think that is the heart of the issue. Okay. It also might be J or K or L or M. It depends how deep you've gone in. I believe also N and maybe O. Uh, those those are all special names um, used for iterators in Doc Assemble. Okay. So maybe we have debugged a problem. Um, you'll have to tell us how that how that turns out. Um, I will do. It's I mean yeah. it's tricky for me to test any solutions partly because I have not been able to replicate it myself. <laughs> yes, uh, we might be able to replicate it if we think this is the problem. The part that's really f interesting to me is that you're not getting. Um, they are not running, they are not running into error screens. And I wonder if there's a setting on the server that prevents that. And if not, then I'm wondering how they do not run into error screens, because that should not be possible. Uh, yes, they, they do have emails uh, sending, they do have errors sent in emails sending, I believe they send the variables, or at least they send the interview and then um, the, the errors send the, the link to the interview or the session ID or something, and they can look up the variables with um, the snapshot. Um, it does list the specific variable. Fun. That is so strange. Yeah, but they're not getting into an error. Can't you get the emails to also send the, uh, the variables file? So that you could then read through that and use that to fill out the interview yourself, so that you know exactly what they put in, such that they're that it was generating the error. So I don't know what Vivian and Matt's policy is, but if you do that, you should make your users aware that you are storing their variables and sending them in, in storing their answers and sending them in emails to yourself or a service. And then you have to be very careful to make sure to delete those uh, emails and anywhere you save those values, just as a, a note of caution. Generally, you know, um, in, in a lot of organizations, the policy is to take the least information possible. So, very fair, but, yeah. but I mean, if you can't replicate the issue, that might be one thing yeah. to look into. Yeah, for sure. Um, I also wonder if I, I if you have a dev in a production server, um, I wonder if you would be able to, uh, if, if you are perhaps testing on the dev server and getting the problems on the production server, um and maybe if you well if you set up some ale kiln tests <laughs> to run and especially once we have random input testing um you wouldn't want to set them up on the production server but if you could uh it might be able to help you replicate it on the dev server someday um uh but uh is is do you have vivian a to well you you can think about whether whether it's a an issue based on the server and such. 
but uh, that's a good point, Matt. Uh, you can get the variables as long as you are legally allowed to have that information and all those things, legally and morally, I would say, is my general principle. Um, I think we've covered that. Index error list index out of range is a fun one that is um, often confounding. And index out of range, what is index out of range exception and how do I fix it? And it's a common exception in different languages. You're looking for um, um, Python specifically, but uh, it won't tell you exactly how to hunt it down in your code. And it's going to be for an audience that is a little different. You might be able to find enough informa information out there for that kind of thing. But what is going on is you are probably on a screen and saying something like um, users one dot main dot first. And you haven't, you, you said, oh, there's only one user. And now DocAssemble is trying to find user one. And it says, I don't have a user one. Uh, I only have a user zero. So this is when you're trying to get an element of an, ar of an array of a list that doesn't exist. So it's in a list, it's using an index of some kind. And usually if you're, if you're doing something like I, it won't be a problem because DocAssemble in, in the correct place, of course, because DocAssemble is iterating only through what exists. But if you hard code one, um, I've also seen people do it in code when they say, you know, how many users? And the user says one, and they go users zero dot name dot first, that old chestnut, and then users one dot name dot first. So um, I don't know what, uh, context Matt was running into it uh, in, but these are two common, you know, so good question. Uh, these are two common situations in which I see folks running into this particular error. Um, okay. So, oh. We're just about at time. Thank you, Michelle, sure. very much. Sure. And obviously, if people have future questions, hit us up in the coding help forum in our channel in Microsoft Teams or join us on our Monday meetings. And if um, folks have uh, are interested, I can do a more extensive. Um, I don't know. It's not called DocaCon anymore, but we use like quarterly. Uh, get togethers. Um, I could do some kind of presentation about debugging generally, about um, development. I don't know. It depends what people are interested in. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that's a good point. If anybody has ideas for things they'd like to see in future Wednesday workshops, let us know. You can email us. You can uh, drop a note in Microsoft Teams. There's a post in there asking for suggestions, and I'm keeping a list. So Thanks so much. Michelle, thank you. And everybody else, see you around. Yeah. You're welcome. Bye, everyone.